Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Hope this is a, a special week for you um, and that you'll take some time just to be reflective and be thankful to the Lord and let uh, him be point out all the gifts in your life. If you don't know, Thanksgiving was one of those special holidays that was started during the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln was convinced by a lady who for 36 years lobbied the U.S. presidents to make a national day of Thanksgiving, and he finally, he wore she wore him down. Let's just put it that way. She was a powerful lady. And uh, that's our holiday that we get to celebrate this week. I also wanted to say that just pastorally that we here at Cornerstone are noticing that uh, as f- for some people, um, a response or a fallout or a celebration from the election, there is just still a lot of turmoil and fear for a lot of people. And that's, a, you know, we're not here to fix all that. But what is a problem is we see it affecting our unity as a congregation. And that's really a problem that we just want to encourage all of us to remember that we share Jesus in common, and that's what matters most. And we are called to build his kingdom, to serve him, and to love one another, despite our differences. And so uh, we just want to keep encouraging that as things aren't calming down. Um, And so please um, continue to do the things that he's called you to do and to take this family of Cornerstone very serious. All right? So... I don't want to talk about that, thank goodness, for very long. I do have some great stories to tell you today, and I want to start with one that comes from the AP during World War II. This is about a a Christian uh, master sergeant that was found in a prisoner of war camp. This is how it reads. The Nazi soldiers made their orders very clear. Jewish American prisoners of war were to be separated from fellow brothers in arms and sent to an uncertain fate. But Master Sergeant Roddy Edmonds would have none of that. As the highest-ranking non-commissioned officer held in the German POW camp, he ordered more than a 1,000 American captives to step forward with him and brazenly pronounced that we are all Jews here. U.S. soldiers had been warned that Jewish fighters among them would be in danger if captured and were told to destroy dog tags and any other evidence identifying themselves as Jewish. So when the German camp commander, speaking in English, ordered the Jews to identify themselves, Edmund knew what was at stake. Turning to the rest of the POWs, he said, We're not going to do that. We're all falling out together. With all the camp's inmates defiantly standing in front of their barracks, the German commander turned towards Edmonds and said, they cannot all be Jews, to which Edmonds replied, we are all Jews here. Then the Nazi officer pressed his pistol to Edmonds' head and offered him one last chance, and Edmonds merely gave him his name, his rank, his serial number, as required by the Geneva Conventions, and he said to him, are you going to shoot us all? And the German officer put his gun down. That day, over 200 Jewish American soldiers were saved by the heroism of not just one man, but many, many others. May we be as committed to one another despite our differences. Something like that, right? All right, let me tell you what's happening today. It's kind of uh, an experiment in a sermon. I'm going to have a lot of scripture to share with you, but we're going to look at it through different eyes. And I'm going to partner with what Gene did last week. And so... Last week, if you remember, Gene shared the story about Christian and Jewish relations throughout history that is not a very good one. Uh, Most Jews know the story. Very few Christians know the story. And that's significant because as followers of Jesus, we're called to love those that um, are in need and to help those that are far from God come to know Jesus as their personal Savior and to follow him and have faith in him. And it's very, very hard unless we know what people are thinking when we begin to talk to them about spiritual things. And so that message last week was very sobering hearing about 1,900 years of how, in many cases, Christians have done the worst possible things to, to Jews. And so we know the story, and we know that now so that we might be more effective and build more unity as a congregation and find center around Jesus. A lot of times people just think here at Cornerstone, they'll hear something, they'll be like, you guys are just about uh, kumbaya. It's like, no, 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 it's unity around Jesus always, okay? That's what it's about. And so that's what even that message was about last week. Today, I'm going to tell us some more of the history, but it's on the other side. And so this isn't meant to be what I call a butt message, okay? And let me explain that because you're visualizing that already, all right? <clears throat> when I'm at home and I do something that I need to apologize to my wife about, it's not much of an apology if I say, hey, honey, I'm sorry, but... I felt this way, you did that. The but is a word of justification, right? This word justify, or this message today justifies nothing. You can't go back and change the history. You can't go back and give people their lives back. It is an and message, 
okay? It's a message of there was some serious, seriously dark things that took place that hurt people who were innocent and tarnished the name of Jesus, which is something we should grieve. But at the same time, there were those that followed Jesus to the truest sense, and they were lights that burned bright in dark times. It's an and story, and so that's what I want to do. We're also starting something that we're going to pepper in throughout the year, a series called Heroes, okay? I love history. I think today, more than ever, where we're told all of these things that are negative about faith and Jesus and Christians, that we need to know that there has been some that have gone before us that were bright lights in dark times. They truly were Jesus to their dark world, okay? So, I'm going to tell you about Patrick and the Celts later on. We'll talk about the first missionaries. We'll talk about those in England in the 1700s that abolished slavery. Amazing stories. But today, we're going to look at those Christians who stood with the Jews during the Holocaust and acted as heroes. Let me say a few things about why heroes are important today. When life is dark, people begin to wonder where God is. They say, God, where are you? Jesus, where are you? And the way that he answers that question many times is he sends people to be like him, to be his hands and his feet, to lay down their lives as Jesus did so that people can see that God has not abandoned us. Heroism, you could say, is a combination of courage and excellence that meets despair and darkness. Jesus was the greatest hero that ever lived. He was an example of this, but he's touched people's lives. So throughout history, we've had other people who have acted in a very similar way. I read this quote this week that I, it, for me at least, frames the idea of this here he's called heroes. This is how it goes. Goodness must be searched, understood, and taught. And I have four little boys, and I want them to know about the courage of Jesus. And so I love telling them stories that, that illustrate that. We need heroes in our culture. More than we need this obsession with our reputation, we need to be focused on character. We need grit over glam. We need long-term over short-term. We need people who live for something bigger than themselves rather than just the things that makes them feel good in the moment. We need something beyond role models even. We need heroes that inspire something in us, that inspire the life of Jesus to be lived out in the world that he's given us, okay? Let me mention a few scriptures. All of these heroes that we'll share through the series, including today, they took the word, these words of Jesus very seriously, and some of them took his words quite literally, all right? So the first is Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and 16. I love this, because if you're a follower of Jesus, this is who you are and who you are called to be every day of your life. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. All the heroes took these words seriously. Or in Luke 10, when Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You can throw the great commission in there. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. These are people that took his words seriously. If you remember the greatest commandment, there's this question that goes around, who's my neighbor? Jesus answers the question by telling a story of basically enemies caring for one another. And then he puts the question back on one of his listeners, and he says, which one of these do you think was a neighbor? And the man's response was, the one that had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. In other words, the one that acted. The one that acted upon their faith. John chapter 15. This is one of these things that heroes took literally. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that they lay down one's life for a friend. Of course, Jesus is talking about the gospel here, here where Jesus laid down his life to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. But what he's also saying is, when you're with me, you begin to do the things that I do. And you're willing to make the sacrifices that I have made. And you do it for others. So this is what heroes do. And we're going to focus in on this time in history where Christians follow Jesus in a unique way by standing with the Jews. So if you go back beyond the Holocaust, which I'm going to focus on that in a moment, you'll find stories about the Crusades. For example, the First Crusade, which a lot of times we don't know about, but these Crusader armies, as they're moving through Europe, they began killing Jews in the villages. But we have a number of records of um, churches and the archbishop of a community hiding Jews in their churches, in their town halls, and in their homes, protecting them. There's one story in Cologne, Germany, 
that during Shavuot, imagine this, one of your special holidays, you're celebrating, and uh, uh, someone among us is caught by an enemy and killed that night because of their faith. Well, this is exactly what happened. A Jewish woman is killed by some crusaders, and the Christians in the town respond by saying, we're going to protect them, and they hide them in their homes until the crusader armies had passed. We have record of George Washington writing to Jewish communities early on, saying, pledging to them his protection and his support, and we could go on and on, but I want to focus here on the stories from the Holocaust. In his book, Bonhoeffer by Eric Metaxas, he describes the dilemma this way. In light of the events in Germany at the time, everyone was trapped in a situation of ethical impossibilities. Now, I think it's safe for us to say that most of us, if not all of us in the room, have never faced a dilemma that says, you know, I'm, I'm faced with the choice of following Jesus by loving others. And holding my convictions. But to do that, I lose my life. Or to do that, I lose the life of someone I love. Or I lose something else that I care very much about. This scenario takes place in the world today. This is happening in the world today. But for most of us, this is such a foreign thing. But this is exactly what was taking place in occupied Europe during World War II. Metaxas goes on to say, in light of the monster monstrous evils being committed all around because of the Nazis. Christians were faced with this decision. What could one do and what should one do? Some did nothing. Some cooperated, but some chose to be lights during a dark time. And I'm going to tell you some of these stories. The first one is of a Dutch village called Newlander. This is a neat story because it's an entire community which really represented an entire faith community. These are followers of Jesus, and you have this entire community come together. It started off by two farmers, and you'll see one of the pictures up there. Uh, you can go to the, the picture of that guy. There he is. He's got a worse haircut than I do. Um, that's why I put him up there. I'm encouraged by our staff daily to cut my hair, so I'm just doing this in defiance of them. So. But this guy and one of his friends start hiding Jews in their, in their barn and protecting them. They're feeding them. They know that their faith in Jesus compels them to act because they're in danger. They realize that they can't do this on their own. And so they begin to build alignment and unity within the village. And within just a few months, all 700 families in the village are protecting and hiding Jews in their home. And when asked why they did it, Jesus compelled us to. How could we not? See, this is real faith in action and a moment in history. I could tell you, and I've mentioned this story before about the Huguenots in a small village in southern France, that young Jewish children were sent out of Paris into this, this village in the mountains where they were protected, and they're credited for saving 5,000 Jews during the Holocaust because of their faith. See, it wasn't just about being a nice person. It was because Jesus compelled them to do something that was very dangerous and hard to tell you about other faith communities. Now remember, these are lights, just a few of them shining in a very dark place. But I could tell you about some Benedictine nuns outside of Krakow, Poland. Once the ghetto was set up, uh, these women couldn't help but notice uh, how terrible it was. They knew it was taking place, and so they began to form an underground railroad where they would smuggle um, Jews out of the ghetto and try to get them into safe places. What I love about this story about these nuns is in 1945, right before a Jewish uprising in the ghetto, most of their weapons from outside were smuggled in by the nuns. <laughs> Guns, knives, I don't know what else, pitchforks, <laughs> in their abbots. They were heroes. May we be as wise as they were, right? Or of those villages, may we have the unity to do common good the way they did. I could tell you about a diplomat in Portugal named Aristides Mendes, who his government told him that they weren't allowed to accept visas of any Jews leaving Germany, even though that this, had kind of, this was against their national policy, but they were afraid of what Hitler was going to do. And Mendes said, I can't help but do that. And he allowed any Jew that had submitted a visa to come and live in Portugal to, uh, to come in. And it was at great expense to his own career, 
which for him was a prestigious career that he cared about. He ended up losing his job. And this is one of the things he said. Listen to this. This is what a hero sounds like. This is what someone who's been captured by Jesus and loves others the way the Good Samaritan did. This is what they sound like. It says, my government has denied all applications for visas to any refugees, but I cannot allow these people to die. Many are Jews. And our constitution says that the religion, the politics of a foreigner shall not be used to deny him refuge into Portugal. And I've decided to follow this principle. I'm going to issue a visa to anyone who asks for it, regardless of whether or not he can pay or she can pay even if I am dismissed. And then he says this, and here's the real reason why. I can only act as a Christian as my conscience tells me. He had something real, not just empty religion. He had something very real that compelled him to lay down something important to him. May we have the type of faith that would make such sacrifices for people around us, whoever they might be. This is Irina Sedler. She is a Polish Catholic nurse um, that was working uh, in and around the Warsaw Ghetto. She was working for Warsaw Social Services. She noticed what was taking place. She is credited, listen to this, for smuggling out 2,500 Jewish children out of the ghetto, saving their lives. She would place them in Polish Catholic families where they would protect the kids' identity, care for them during the war. She was smart enough to keep an archive of their Jewish name so that at the end of the war, they could be reunited with their families. But we know that that, for most of them, was not possible. But she's a hero. Today, in Israel, they refer to her as one of the righteous among the nations. May we be so dedicated to love others that are in need or in danger or that are far from God this way. Let me tell you about another ordinary person, but this is more like an ordinary family. And it's the Ten Boom. So how many of you are familiar with Corey Ten Boom from movie and the book? <clears throat> I've actually never watched the movie or read the book, but I've read biographies about her, and I want to tell you about her. Her family was extraordinary. And it's no um, coincidence that the children were heroes because the parents raised heroes. Okay, so let me tell you about this family. Casper and Cornelia Ten Boom were the parents. They had four outstanding children, Betsy, Noli, William, and Carrie. Um, And the family was tight-knit, and their life centered around two things. The first was the family's watch-banking business that had been passed down from generations through the family. So life centered around that. But life also centered around their shared faith in Jesus. And what was neat is that faith in Jesus had been passed down generation to generation. It wasn't just mom and dad's faith or grandpa's faith. They had done a good job as parents to model the joy of following Jesus so that their children chose the same thing. So it's very neat. So you have this family that's extraordinary, and they understood that the way that you care for others who are different than you is one of the hallmarks of being a follower of Jesus. And so early on, you have stories of girls like um, Corey and her sister Betsy caring for disabled children and disabled adults. And you hear stories about the family caring for the poor after World War I when, when much of Germany was stricken with poverty and you have lots of orphans. You have the family doing these amazing things together. You have a grandpa in their family who taught them about the importance of putting your faith in action as the way you care for other people. He actually often talked about how we need to be praying for the safety and protection of the Jews among us because he was noticing something in the 19th century that anti-Semitism was growing throughout Europe. And so he was known weekly for gathering with others and praying for his Jewish friends in his community. So the grandkids grow up seeing this and they're moved and they're stirred. Grandpa prayed that for the blessing and protection of these friends around him. What was ironic is that about 100 years later, in the very same home he prayed in, his son, four of his grandkids, and a great-grandson would all be arrested for helping protect the Jews. Some say it's ironic. Some say that's an answer to prayer. That God answers prayers like that by helping people be heroic. The hands and feet of Jesus in the world that we find ourselves in. Corey's brother, William, was special. In the 1920s, he went to Germany to study, and he began to hear this racist and anti-Semitic rhetoric and just anti-lots of different groups, including the disabled and elderly. And he began to write papers warning the Christian community about what was to come. And guess what happened when he wrote one of his papers? His professor laughed in his face and said, you're paranoid. 
During the occupation, the entire family worked together with others in the Underground Railroad to protect and hide and care for local Jews in their community. They were caught. They all arrested in that home I mentioned, along with 35 others in the underground workers. They, they're co-conspirators, you could say. And the last night the family was together, they gathered around Casper, who is Corey's father, and they prayed. And I want to read you a couple of the Psalms that they prayed together. Because I want you to find yourself hearing, these are the things heroes pray. Okay? They prayed Psalm 32. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and sound me, or surround me with songs of deliverance. They prayed Psalm 119. Think how hard it would be to pray this and mean it under their, their circumstances. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all of their heart. They do, not, they do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. It's the kind of thing heroes pray together. The next day after they gathered around and prayed these psalms, <clears throat> the family was separated, shoved into cattle cars. Their father was killed soon after arriving at a concentration camp. Corey and her sister were put in one. Later on, her sister would be killed. Corey often talks about her sister in the prisoner of war camp. She said even there she was a light. She was Jesus to the people around her. She would share her faith. She would tell people how Jesus loves them. She shared the truth of the gospel. She would care for others. She would call people to joy and to unity rather than this spirit of despair, which is what they found the camp with when they came. Corey credits her sister with transforming the entire social and spiritual environment of a camp, a concentration camp. She said of her sister, and this is very interesting because one thing I think about heroes is they always kind of show us a different way to be human, right? Jesus showed us a different way to be human, a better way. And heroes do the same. They follow in his footsteps. But Corey often said of her sister that she came from another place. Later on, Corey would somehow miraculously survive that time in the concentration camp and be, go on to live a long life. And she became a champion of forgiveness and service. And she often told people that no matter how dark your situation was, there still is the light of Jesus, your hiding place. So I hear stories like this of just ordinary people. They were watchmakers. And I think, may we raise families like that. May we raise children who live for something greater than themselves. The glory of God and his kingdom. Now let me tell you my favorite story. And this is of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So... Six years ago, my brother-in-law gave me a 600-page biography by Eric Metaxas on Bonhoeffer. And at the time, I wasn't really into biographies, although I've read dozens since this. I'm now into it. Um, and I thought, don't you know me very well? I like short books. Um, and this one's 600 pages. And so I started reading it, and then I'd put it down for a while, and I'd read it some more. And it actually took me a year to get through a story that is... Um, so plausible because of, you know, what was taking place, but also plausible in knowing that the kind of faith this, is, this man had, but it was still so remarkable that I was personally inspired to be more and more like him, which is really in turn more and more like Jesus. And so I want to tell you a story. The setting is Germany in the 1930s, and you have this young man in his 20s named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was one of eight children and was born to a remarkable family. His dad was the most famous psychiatrist in the world, Okay for about a 50 year period of time. This is his dad. And his brother was brilliant. He was with Einstein when they split the atom. Okay, so big shoes to fill. This is his older brother. But Dietrich was no slouch. He was very brilliant in his own regard. We're told that he was a brilliant thinker and he was a brilliant musician. And so the family was actually very discouraged when at age 14, he said, the Lord is calling me to be a theologian and into ministry. They thought that was a disappointment. Even though they loved the Lord, they thought, you know, you need to go make some money somewhere, probably. That's probably what they're thinking. But they came around. Dietrich ends up going to Berlin University, which at the time was one of the best theological schools in the world. And there at age 21, he gets his doctorate. So that just shows us how very smart he is, right? He's a freak, okay? He's not like us. But his heroism can be like ours. 
He has to wait till age 25 to be ordained as a minister in uh, the German church. And so he decides he's going to take some trips. And one of the trips he takes is to um, New York City, where he's going to study at Union College, which he described as a huge disappointment. But while he was there, something happened that changed his life. A friend of his, a black man from Alabama, invited him to come with him to an all-black church in Harlem, New York, where every week... They would dance and sing about the goodness of God, share the gospel, and then go out and live it. And it was the first time in his life that he saw the joy and the love that faith in Jesus can have in a person. And his heart was stirred, and he was, we're told that his heart was really on fire, and he went for nine months, and his entire life was changed. During his doctoral studies, he studied this question, what is the church? In nine months in Harlem, he learned more than he did during his doctoral studies. The preaching, the music stirred him. People lived their, their lives in, in a way that was congruent to the way they worshipped on Sundays. He just said it was, it was fantastic. So he comes back to Germany, and he comes back a different man. And he's noticed that he's not the only one that's changed. The country has changed. So during the time that he was gone, the Germans went from the second smallest political party to the second largest. And they're on the rise. And Bonhoeffer is feeling stirred by the Lord to begin to speak out and to try to keep the German church from being contaminated. And so listen to this. Just four days after Hitler rises to power as the Fuhrer, Bonhoeffer gives a national radio speech where he begins to warn German Christians about false leaders. And he says there can only be one savior for the German people. And he often talk about, talked about leadership. He said real leadership is the type that lays down its life for others. It's not the type that says lay down your life for me. And so the man just had conviction and courage, and grace. <clears throat> Nazis were taking over everything. So there was this big internal fight within the German church. And uh, Bonhoeffer, along with other theologians like Karl Barth, put, got together and they wrote something called the Barman Decla Declaration, which is really a repudiation and a separating of themselves from the German church, which was becoming very anti-Semitic and racist and, and violent. 6,000 pastors signed it. This was during a time that the Germans were trying to say to pastors, you need to pledge your allegiance to Hitler, and they were putting pictures of Hitler on the altars of the churches. So in a span of just a few months, you have a few thousand churches and a few thousand pastors that separate from the German church. They create what's called the Confessing Church of Germany, which their goal was to continue building the kingdom of God, advance the Great Commission, and represent Christianity very well during a dark time. They basically said, we're going to be lights in a dark world. By doing so, they officially announced to the world that there was a group of Christians in Germany that officially and publicly declared their independence from the Nazified church. In the months that followed, Bonhoeffer found himself making significant leadership contributions to the new confessing church. He taught and ran an illegal seminary where they taught the scriptures and the gospel was centered to what they taught and he trained leaders this way. Bonhoeffer often preached to large crowds and wrote articles, continued to speak on the radio warning Christians in Germany about what the Nazis were doing. He referred to a type of faith that doesn't act or an apath apathetic type of faith as cheap grace, which is a great way to describe it. In 1938, the seminary was shut down, so they went underground. Eventually, the Gestapo watching Bonhoeffer was trying to censor him. They told him he could no longer make public speeches. They figured out that he now had this underground seminary, just not an illegal one, and they shut that down as well. So he was under scrutiny and under some pressure. But then something happened. Later on in 1938, we have what we remember learning in history class, the Night of Broken Glass, which was a night where the second-in-command of the SS sent a message out to all the Gestapo stations throughout Germany saying, Tonight's the night you're going, you know, you're going to target and um, with violence and attack the Jews. And so they seized property. They destroyed property, homes and businesses. They burned synagogues. Uh, they took people out in the streets and beat them and killed them. And it was a night that shook many in Germany to the core, not everyone. Now, Bonhoeffer was one of those that was very disturbed by this. And the day after the night of broken glass, he went to the scriptures She's a great example to us of what we should do when we are afraid or in the circumstances around us are pressing us and we're thinking, what is happening? We go to the scriptures for guidance. And he went to Psalm 74, and you can see it behind me. 
And it was verse 8 that really stood out to him. He said, they burned every place where God was worshipped in the land. And he wrote in his Bible the date 9-11-38, which was the only time his friends say that he ever wrote anything about contemporary events in his, script, in his Bible. It was almost like he, the Lord said to him, it's happening again. He went on to read some more scriptures. And then days later, he sent a letter out trying to influence that group of people in the confessing church. And he gave them a number of scriptures trying to compel them towards greater action on behalf of those being persecuted around them, the Jews. So he mentioned Psalm 74, 8. He mentioned Zechariah 2, 8. <clears throat> or God calls the Jewish people the apple of his eye. He used Romans 9 and Romans 11 basically to say, you know what, God has not broke his promise to them, and let's hope not so that he'll never break his promise to us. Did they stumble beyond recovery? Not at all, he says. So he writes this, and he's moved. But because the scrutiny kept increasing around him, his friends began to fear for his life, and so they encouraged Dietrich to go away. And so he travels to England, or not to England, to uh, New York City to get away from uh, the persecution that's about to fall on him. And as soon as he gets on the ship for this long voyage, he knows that it's a mistake and he wants to come back. So he's only in New York for a month, less than a month actually, before he goes back. And this is what he wrote to a friend. Okay, this is, these are the things heroes say. I've had time to pray about my situation and that of my nation and to have God's will for me clarified. I will come, I have come to the conclusion that I have made a terrible mistake in coming to America. I must live through this difficult period in our national history with the Christian people of Germany. Now remember, he's a pastor, he's a shepherd. He wants to be with his people. I shall have no right to participate in the reconstruction of a Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share in the trials of this time with my people. My brothers in the confessing um, church wanted me to go. They may have been right in urging me to do so, but I was wrong in going. Such a decision each man or woman should make for himself. Christians in Germany will face the terrible alternative of either willing the defeat of their nation in order that Christian civilization may survive, or you could say the gospel would survive, or willing the action of a nation and thereby destroying our civilization. I know which of these two alternatives I must choose. So he comes back, and that new clarity wasn't just that he was going to be a part of this internal fight uh, among Christians in Germany, but he was now going after the Nazis. And so his brother has a job in German intelligence, and Dietrich gets a job in German intelligence and becomes a spy. And he travels around. I love the guy. He's such a stud. He travels around Europe. And he's sharing information with the allies, and he's a double agent, and he's a spy on behalf of the enemies of the Nazis throughout the world. During this time, he was also a part of planning the Valkyrie assassination plot. He was a part of smaller uh, efforts to smuggle Jewish families out of Germany to protect them. In 1943, he was actually arrested for his part in getting seven Jews to Switzerland. Many thought that he would be released. No one more than his mother and his new fiance. During this time, he had fallen in love, was engaged. As soon as he got out of prison, he was going to marry. During his days in prison, though, right before they thought he was going to get out, the Valkyrie plot happened and failed. And what followed was thousands of arrests and many people who were tortured and many names that were given out. And one of the names that was given out as a co-conspirator to the assassination on Hitler was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And so his fate was sealed. And at dawn, on April 9th, 1944, he was hung as a traitor in a concentration camp. In the days leading to his death, he continued writing to his friends about death. And he would say things like, death is the worst thing that we can face. It's terrifying, it's devastating, and it's final. It is the worst thing. Unless, he always said, you know the God of the Bible. You know the risen Jesus who has changed everything. A few evenings before he was killed, this is what he wrote down as a prayer. And I want to read it to you because this is the kind of thing heroes pray. And you tell me if this doesn't sound like Jesus in the garden, okay? These are the words of Bonhoeffer, his prayer. Oh God, early in the morning do I cry unto thee. Help me to pray 
and to think only of thee. I cannot pray alone. In me there is darkness, but with thee there is light. I am lonely, but thou leaves me not. I am feeble in heart, but thou leaves me not. I am restless, but with you there is peace. In me there is bitterness, but with you there is patience. Thy ways are, are past understanding, but thou knowest the way for me. That sounds like the prayer in the garden, right? Not my way, but your way. Whatever it takes, God. And to pray that prayer, it's certainly a huge struggle. Bonhoeffer told friends before his execution that it was an honor to suffer and to die for the Jews of Germany. His body was burned. One of his friends said it would have been an honor for Dietrich to have his body disposed the same way that the Jews were, their bodies had been disposed by the Nazis. What an amazing story. May we be men and women of such conviction, right? And of courage. Doesn't his life and all the other heroes' life scream Jesus? It was very, very dark. But people said, we will not change who we are or what we do. And their actions compelled them to make the greatest sacrifices on behalf of others around them that they cared for. But ultimately, it was for Jesus that the sacrifice took place. Their life was about him. Let me tell you one last thing that's neat about this idea of heroes. Worship team, you guys can come out. I think this might be the emotion that many of you are feeling right now. Often we use words like inspired or convicted or we want, we want God to do that type of thing in us. We want to love Jesus that way that we'd be willing to do the same thing. Well, recently they, um, psychiatrists have come up with a, a new emotion. So I don't even know how they do this stuff, but it's good and pastors can use it. So I'm glad they did. All right. We can rip it off. But the new emotion that you can read about is co- the emotion called elevation. All right. And I want to describe it to you. When people experience elevation, they feel a mix of awe, reverence, and admiration for a morally beautiful act. They describe it as the emotion of heroism when you see something like that. The emotion is described as as similar to calmness, warmth, and love. Elevation is always precipitated by acts of virtue and moral beauty, and it causes warm, open feelings in the chest. So they're describing the, feel, the physical feelings. It reminds me of the passage of, you know, the heroism of Jesus and our hearts burn inside of us or their hearts burned inside of them because of what he did for them. This is what we want more and more of. I think it's important, as I mentioned earlier, that, that we have these kinds of stories and we say, you know, what, I want to be like that. A lot of times we're saying, hey, don't be like that. But we don't have anyone else we want to be like. Let's be like that. These are people that were markers. They were lights. They were examples of Jesus during very, very dark times. And this is what we want. And so let's bow our heads. And I want to give anyone in the room a chance that doesn't know Jesus. That right now you are living life on your own. The scriptures say of your current state that you are separated from a loving God who draws near to you. But he's gone out of his way through Jesus to say the price has been paid. You are loved this much and forgiveness is free for you because of what I've done. If you do not know him, this is the start of such heroism. Saying to Jesus, I need you. Rescue me. So if you do not know him and you just hear the whisper of God this morning, just confess your need for him. Scriptures say, confess your need for him. Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved, the scriptures say. And for the rest of us, Lord, I find myself in a discomfort of thinking, I want to live for you, God. I'd love to have courage like that, but even a discomfort of wondering, what is it that I would do in moments like that? Father, what I do know is that you give us everything we need to be your followers. And so we ask for more and more of the Holy Spirit to come in and make room for Jesus in us, that his character, his excellence, his courage, his selflessness would be true of us. 
Father, we thank you for stories that we can literally feel with our bodies as an emotion. May we be inspired by you to live like you and to be your lights in a dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand together and worship.